and we will get started. So just give me a minute. All right, so we are live on YouTube and I'm going to get us started. So thanks for joining us today at another media briefing. It is Wednesday, April 15th. And before I pass it over to our speakers, I'm just going to give media a quick reminder that um, we are now posting briefing notes from Dr. Wong and Chair Redman on our website after each media briefing. Um, so for those who missed that, on Monday, the uh, URL is regionofwaterloo.ca slash media briefings. On that page, there's also a link to our YouTube channel. And so all of our Zoom media briefings are archived there. So if you miss one and you wanna watch it, you can go there. Or if you just want to check a fact, um, you can also review the videos there. Um, for those who have been on our website, you will notice that um, it has been growing very fast. I believe we have about 25 COVID related pages that have been added to our website at some point in the last six weeks. Um, so uh, in addition to a wealth of health information, we also have quite a bit of info on, you know, closures, enforcement information, um, how you can help, a community newsletter, all sorts of things. So I encourage you to keep going back and uh, looking for uh, the information that we're posting there. And we appreciate your patience as we try to figure out how to essentially build a miniature website inside our website. So I will pass it to our speakers. Today we have a statement from Acting Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Shuli Wong, followed by a statement from Regional Chair Redmond. Our CAO, Mike Murray, is also standing by to answer any questions. And with that, I will pass it over to you, Shuli. Thank you, Bethany. Thank you everyone for joining us. I am sad to report that since my last update on Monday and as of 7 p.m. last evening, we have four more COVID-19 deaths to report um, for a total of 15 COVID-related deaths. We are counting all deaths where the person was COVID-19 positive. I wish again to express my deepest condolences to the families, loved ones, and caregivers of those who have passed. You will also have noticed that the number of confirmed cases continues to rise as we have undergone an expansion of testing since late last week. Most of this case has been due to additional cases detected in long-term care and retirement homes. As expected, we are now seeing and will continue to see in the next few days, the significant increase in numbers of residents and staff who have tested positive in these settings. These results will give us a clearer picture of the status of COVID-19 in these homes. Detecting these cases now will help us reduce the number of additional cases in the future. That said, measures have already been put in place in anticipation of the increased numbers. We now have 14 long-term care homes and retirement homes under outbreak. A majority continue to be stable and have low numbers of cases. Our residents continue to be to to um, to help us and um, cooperate with the uh, difficult public health measures. And uh, because of this, our residents have made an impact. So I wish to thank the community again for doing all that they can to help us fight this pandemic and to let them know that we are continuing to make a difference. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Karen, I'll pass it over to you uh, for your statement now. Thanks, Bethany. <clears throat> 
I would like to echo Dr. Wong's comments and express my sincerest sympathies to those who have lost loved ones to COVID-19. We're thinking of all of you who are currently ill and who have sick family members or friends. To continue our efforts to keep regional residents safe, I would like to take a moment to encourage parents to talk to their teenage children about COVID-19. Many teens do not see COVID-19 as a threat to their own health and well-being. Help them understand that not practicing physical distancing can make them, their parents, or other family members very sick, especially if someone um, has a compromised immune system or other health condition. What's more upsetting to them is the social isolation they feel at the time, this time in their lives when socializing with friends is so important to their development and mental well being. Here are some tips um, to start the conversation. It's okay for them to be sad and disappointed. Listen and empathize. Expect frustration about their social lives. Social isolation is very uncomfortable for teens, and it's especially difficult when their friends are not sticking to the rules. Stick to a routine as much as possible. Example, meal times, homework time, chores. Treat teens as problem-solving partners. Ask them to help create the daily schedule. Allow privacy and alone time. They can connect with their friends online. Enlist other adults to talk to your teen if you prefer. And lastly, model good behavior for your teens by not bending the rules with your own friends and family. We need everyone practicing physical distancing in order to slow the spread of COVID-19. And the more we distance, the sooner we can start socializing again. Thanks, Thanks Chair Redman. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to media for questions. So we'll start with you, Ben, um, if you can uh, unmute yourself and ask your questions. Oh, well, you... sorry, I just had to figure that out. I'm on a new laptop today, sorry about that. Um, I, I have a question just specifically about Forest Heights, Rivera. Is there any particular reason that the numbers at that long-term care home are so high? You need to unmute yourself, please, Dr. Wong. Right. Hi, Ben. No, thanks for your question. Um, I think what we have seen across the province and with, with um, homes like Forest Heights is that this is something that can spread very rapidly, uh, which is why very stringent measures uh, need to be put in place for these homes. Um, I don't think we can fully understand right at this time um, why, you know, um, there may be some homes in which it's spreading faster or more rather, uh, they all spread very fast. Um, but what I can tell you is that um, you know, the appropriate precautions that need to be put in place according to the latest guidelines are being put in place. And uh, I know the home is also working very hard uh, and working uh, collaboratively with us uh, to implement those measures as soon as possible. Okay, uh, just, just to follow up about that then, is after this is all done, of course, uh, I assume there's going to be some kind of some kind of a review as to how all homes conducted themselves and how we can do better next time? Yes, I'm sure there will be. Okay, no further questions at the moment. Thanks, Ben. I will pass it over to Kate from CBC. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Um, th this is also for Dr. Wong um, in terms of long-term care homes. Um, we received an email from someone whose family member is at, you know, Waterloo home, where over the weekend, you know, they were trying to lift spirits and they had someone going around in a bunny suit and they took a video and it's very clear that this bunny is hugging residents, getting nice and close to them. Um, I mean, when it comes to the precautions that homes are being told to take, can you kind of go over what that includes? Like, under normal circumstances, yes, a bunny going around would be lovely on Easter, but maybe not, um, you know, the bunny was wearing a mask, but I'm not, I'm not sure that's quite as safe as maybe they could have been. Could yeah. you maybe talk well, on that a bit? Yeah, um, it depends uh, this, uh, on the status of the home, um, but all homes have to put in place measures 
you know, for example, to uh, significantly uh, restrict visitors uh, and screen those that do come in and uh, put in place measures to, uh, um, to enable physical distancing. So uh, actually I can't speak to that specific situation because I don't know what happened there. Uh, but we would be happy to, to take that information and, and, and follow up. Sure, yeah, I can forward that to Julie um, yes. or somebody. Yes, um, the other question I had was yesterday during the regional committee meeting, you were asked a little bit by um, uh, Mayor Schantz about residential homes um, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. like there's other clients who aren't necessarily, um, you know, seniors living in long-term care, but they are people that live in group homes. What is the region doing on, on that aspect of, you know, testing and, and, and that sort of thing? Thank you for your question, Kate. So yes, we are detecting more cases in, in other uh, settings like, uh, like these homes as a result of the expanded testing. I don't have the numbers to share with you at this time, um, but if and when there are cases, the homes will communicate with their residents, staff, and residences, residents, families, uh, that is those who need to know, uh, and whether it's a long-term care home, a retirement home, or a group home, uh, we are providing similar support in terms of measures to minimize further spread. And will, will they be reported on the website at all? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have numbers to share with you at this time because we are focused on providing support to these homes as the first priority. Um, you know, we will look at to see what we can do uh, as soon as we can do it. But, but we're, providing the, we're providing the support and the, the people that need to know, uh, such as the, the residents, the staff and the families of those residents are being informed. Great, I'm gonna leave it there, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Kate. Okay, I will pass it on to Joanna from the record. Thank you. Um, just another question about long-term care. Um, and I, I, I think I see a thread here. I guess like what reassurances can you provide to the community that these very vulnerable people are being adequately protected? Like, is there enough staffing? Are they being isolated properly? Are these homes being inspected? This is something I think con that concerns a lot of people in the community, especially as we see the cases, um, the numbers of cases rise along with the deaths. Mm -hmm. So, no, I think that's an excellent question, uh, uh, Joanna. So, uh, I think uh, you know um, these are extraordinary times. Um, there are, I think, I think it's fair to say there are system issues. Uh, in, for, for these homes that existed prior to COVID-19 and that continue to exist now. Um, so you mentioned one of them, um, you know, the, the strain on staffing and ensuring that there's sufficient staffing. Um, uh, Long-term care homes and retirement homes have their own regulatory authorities uh, who oversee these homes. Uh, in public health, our role is to support them when they um, become in outbreak. So that's when we, we, we come into the picture and help support the homes. But in cases where there are, um, you know, active outbreaks, like we have a few in our region, um, we also engage and, uh, and uh, work with the regulatory authority, as well as, um, you know, uh, the, in the case of certain homes, they have a parent company. So we will work with a parent company, for example, Forest Heights, it's Rivera. And uh, so, you know, uh, we engage the, the inspector, for instance, uh, for the long-term care, um, for the long-term care homes. We engage um, parent companies. We also work with our, um, you know, uh, regional healthcare partners, um, such as the Lynn. And, um, you know, uh, we'll, we, we speak, for instance, uh, with, um, with other partners as well, such as uh, primary care physicians and um, and, and hospitals, uh, you know, to see if there's there's things that can be done uh, to further help support these homes, um, you know. And we also um, let the province know. We escalate the issues that we're seeing on the ground to the province. And I understand that the province is in the process of making 
um, you know, some new uh, changes uh, to the system to enable better support for these homes. Okay. And then sort of a related but different question. So mm -hmm. we're seeing um, a rise in the cases and the deaths mm -hmm. in long-term care, but hospitalizations are pretty steady. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that a sign that physical distancing measures are working and that the general population is sort of um, being protected um, mm -hmm. against getting the virus in yeah. that way? Sorry, yes. Thank you for that question, Joanna. And yes, um, I, um, as I mentioned uh, at my briefing, I think it was last Friday, um, you know, uh, we had taken the provincial projections uh, of deaths and we had extrapolated to our region. And uh, those were projections um, at the provincial level that were done by experts. And uh, it, it demonstrated that the measures that we have put in place at the provincial level, as well as at the Waterloo region level have had a significant impact in terms of prevention of deaths. We would have had many more times deaths than, than we have so far, you know, due to those uh, social and physical distancing measures, um, those, those uh, closures of, of businesses and things like that, although they're very, very difficult. Um, you know, they have had a, a very significant impact. Um, so yes, yeah, so it is a good sign that for instance, our hospital capacity continues to be to be good at this moment, um, and I do believe that the number of uh, community cases um, has not risen at the rate that we would expect uh, normally uh, because of those social and physical distancing measures that we put in place. Right now, um, what we see happening, where um, you know the greatest attention and work is being focused is on the long-term care homes and retirement homes because we have seen things that like we, we, didn't, we didn't expect in the beginning, which was the, 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 the speed at which uh, this virus uh, can spread in long-term care homes uh, and also the, 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 the breadth at which you know, homes can be uh, impacted uh, by this virus. And so it's really important um, that we, you know, we continue to put um, um, the, the best measures possible uh, for these homes um, as, we, as we see the situation evolve. And do you think that those enough, has, en uh, enough measures have been put in place to sort of limit this I in long-term care? Yeah, I think we need to, I think we need to continue to uh, put in place, uh, you know, uh, the, the measures um, that have been, um, that, are, that have been recommended by the province. And uh, I know that locally here, we are putting them in place as soon as we get them. So there, there, there's new guidance that comes out um, regularly and there's been updated guidance for long-term care. Um, you know, in the last week, uh, there have been uh, additional measures that have been recommended for these homes and we have put those, we have put those in place. That said, as we talked about a bit earlier, there is system strain on these long-term care homes, uh, so it is a significant challenge uh, that this that you know uh, long-term care homes and uh, retirement homes uh, are, are facing. And uh, I understand, you know, there's going to be uh, some more provincial supports that are coming, and we're looking forward to that. Great, thank you. Thanks, Joanna. Okay, I'm going to pass it over to Irene from the Air News. Irene. No questions at this time, thank you. Great, thanks Irene. Uh, Nicole from CTV. Hi, good morning. Uh, just give me a quick second here. I have to get back sure. into my um, document. Um, first question that I've had um, comes from a lot of concerned nurses and some PSWs mm -hmm. uh, who have tested positive. Mm -hmm. They are being told by public health when they get that phone call to stay home and self-isolate, but According to the Ministry of Health guidelines for long-term care homes, they say staff who test positive but don't show symptoms can show up to work and wear PPE. Mm -hmm. What is public health stance in regards to this? And you know, what are you doing to deal with this confusion of health instructions coming from public health and then coming from the ministry? Yeah. Well, thanks for the question. So 
Um, what we provide to those who test positive and our healthcare workers is the same as what the ministry has, has recommended. So it's the same guidance. Um, so um, healthcare workers may be fulfilling critical roles uh, and um, therefore um, under certain conditions, they can come back to work uh, uh, on, as long as they uh, uh, wear the appropriate personal protective equipment and are screened appropriately um, and don't have any symptoms and, and are asymptomatic. And so that is correct, what the ministry guidance is, is saying. But I understand, you know, there are, um, you know, we've heard reports too that there are healthcare workers who do not wish to return to work. And, um, you know, the guidance also says that if you're not a critical worker and uh, not required to return to work, then, you know, then you can stay at home or yeah so that's that that that's the guidance um i'm just wondering um their their employer their employer and their organization would know best whether th those workers are critical or not to their operations and so we what we tell them is for um you know for whether or not they need to return to work or, um, or they can stay at home, it would be their employer who would know best based on their role in the organization. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I have to pop in back into Zoom. I'm not sure if, is Mike here? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, since the last update, I'm just wondering if, you know, I guess maybe Karen, you can address this as well since you spoke about teams, but have you seen an increase in non-compliance um, throughout the region, whether it be teens, businesses, or individuals? Um, and you know, is how is this being handled? Yeah, <clears throat> so I, I'm not sure that we've got you know good information today about you know relative rates of compliance or non-compliance. You know, we're out there regularly with public health inspectors, bylaw officers, area municipal bylaw officers, um, doing both compliance checks and enforcement. Um, what we're planning to do is report on those uh, enforcement and compliance activities about once a week. So I'm hoping on Friday at our media briefing to have updated stats on you know, what's happened in terms of compliance checks and, and enforcement. And then we'll try to get into a regular cycle of once a week reporting on that. But as of today, I don't have any additional information from what we shared on Monday. And, well, and the, sorry, go ahead. And I was just going to say, um, um, my caution about teens is more anecdotal. I don't know that we have stats, but we do know uh, talking to people and having conversations that parents are finding it hard to have teens to continue to comply. So that's why that was highlighted. I don't have any statistics to uh, support that, but we know it's a an element of uh, getting families to uh, re continue to um, physically. Okay, do you have any more questions, Nicole? Um, let me just see through. Oh, um, we um, grocery garden centers have started popping up. Will they be allowed to open garden centers in, par in their parking lots? Mike, are you able to? Talk to this? That's a really good question. Uh, I think we will have to check on that and see if that fits the criteria for what are considered essential businesses. Mm -hmm. You know, the province has a pretty extensive list of criteria for what's essential and what's not. If they fit within that criteria, then there's no reason why they couldn't operate. On the other hand, if that doesn't fit, then they shouldn't be opening. Anything further, Nicole? Nope, that's good. Thank you. Great. Thanks. I, th I am going to pass it to Damon. I think uh, Damon is our last speaker. So um, you guys could just let me know if you have if I missed anyone or there's any further questions, but I will pass it to Damon now. Okay, thank you. Um, so to start off, um, I'm not sure if this was covered early, I just had some connection issues. Um, but back on Monday, I asked about um, specific breakdowns of statistics for areas in the region. Um, so with the recent outbreak, do you think having like this idea that Waterloo region is this huge area, then seeing it in a small community like a Woolwich Township could 
trigger like the opposite of what we were expecting because it the contagion rate's still at the same level, correct? If that yes, the risk across the region is the same. And um, you know, um we are testing specifically in long-term care homes and retirement homes. Mm -hmm. We're not testing in the broad community uh, because of the prioritized provincial testing guidelines. Um, so we're going to see more cases in those homes. And you're right, Damon, that is going to skew the numbers if we broke down the numbers by municipality, right? Because uh, you're going to, where there are more long-term care homes and retirement homes, that's where there are going to be more cases. Um, but that should not, um, you know, lead anyone to um, assume that that means that places that have less of those homes, for example, and um, would have, you know, would have less confirmed cases because there's limited testing, um, would have a le would have um, less risk. This is an infection that we know spreads very quickly and has spread very broadly across our region already. Um, so there's there's no reason to assume that one area would be at greater or less risk. I think we have to assume that everywhere in the region there could be risk. You're right though, in these settings, there is an increased risk. That is why there are increased measures for these settings. Has there been any backlash from either um, community groups or uh, people in uh, politics um, towards the lack of breakdowns in statistics? This could be for either Dr. Wong or Karen Redmond or Mike Murray. Yeah. yeah so, oh. No, I'll, I'll just I'll make a comment, and that is, you know, I think just consistent with what I both I said and Dr. Wong said on Monday. Um, so we've heard those requests. Um, we get it. And that is work that public health, um, you know, is in the process of doing. Um, so when they can get around to that, um, they will make those breakdowns available. Um, you know, right now they're prioritizing contact management, case management, as, as I think everybody would hope and expect them to do. But as they can get to, um, you know, disaggregating or breaking down the regional statistics onto an area municipal basis, um, they'll do that. And then when it's when that work is done and, and validated and verified, then they'll make that information available to the public. Yeah, I'll just add, Damon, um, you may have noticed that, you know, on our website, we do list all the outbreaks in long term care and retirement home and um, specifics about those outbreaks. And, you know, it's one area that we've chosen to focus on that I don't think others have necessarily focused on mm -hmm. in their Reporting, but we felt it was important because of the risk in these settings in terms of information to keep the public aware, uh, uh, informed of. That is taking up a significant amount of our staff time to try to get to, to you know, to try to provide the numbers um, that help the community understand, you know, where, you know, where, what, what the situation is like. And so as, as, as uh, Mike, Mike said, you know, we've heard that request um, you know, we're, we're, we're working on it, but we're trying to, we're trying to um, prioritize what's more important in the, in the immediate term. And as our numbers get, as our numbers get higher, I have to admit, right, there are, there are some reporting is going to, is going to lag, right? But uh, we'll try our best to continue to focus on the most important reporting. And then just one quick last question. I was speaking with uh, Greg Bouchard over at uh, Elmira Community Living, where they have an active outbreak. And he said he only really felt support from the community, um, not from provincial government or federal government. Um, what else can the community do to continue to support uh, these residential homes in outbreak? Well, you know what? It's great that they're feeling the support for the community because the worst thing that could happen is the community feels somehow, you know, uh, these are residents that, uh, you know, uh, present a risk to them. Uh, any one of us in the community could become affected. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's great that they're feeling that support from their community. I think that just speaks to um, the type of community that, that, that exists there. So that, that, that's great to hear. Um, yeah, I just think that, you know, um, with these settings where there can be a little bit more vulnerability, um, there needs to be, in addition to the type of infection prevention support that public health can provide, that type of community support is going to really help those types of homes. Perfect. And, it, Thank you. and if I can just add, um, not specifically about the group home, but I would mm -hmm. have to tell you that 
um, in all my experience politically, I've never seen both levels of government be more willing to work together, be more communicative and collaborative with us at the municipal, municipal level because they recognize we're closest to the people and they are listening as how they go forward and shape, whether it's um, public health, whether it's uh, first responders, PPE, or how we deal with the economic fallout. They are collaborating and listening. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly add, so, you know, when we escalate issues up, um, you know, we know like they've been they've been received, and then we do see things like new guidance or new directives that come down to help us manage um, uh, locally. So that might not be seen as easily by people that are in the ground uh, on the ground, but that, that is happening, like Chair Redmond said. Okay, thank you. That's all my questions. Thanks, Damon. So um, Irene and uh, Kevin have indicated that they don't have any questions. Is that still true for both of you? Anybody else, any final questions? Okay, so we're gonna wrap it up. Um, we will see everyone again on Friday and uh, thanks again, you know, media play a really important role in this pandemic. So we appreciate your ongoing support. Mm -hmm. Thanks everyone, see you Friday.